Turning to one of my favourite topics for the moment, this rather fabulous memorial, which as Annette mentioned, was unveiled right back 100 years ago on the 9th of February 1917. It was carved by Kathleen Scott, who was of course the widow of Captain Robert Falcon Scott, the man who is, uh, the statue is of, and commemorates him as well as the four members of the Polar Party who perished upon their return from the South Pole in January 1912. One might ask, why on earth Christchurch, a city some 20,000 kilometres from Britain, has such an intimate connection with a British Antarctic expedition? Today I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and we're going to take a bit of a journey through the context of this memorial as well, a time of course when New Zealand and the British Empire is embroiled in the First World War. We'll take a look at Kathleen's involvement, how she came to be involved in this project, and also talk a little bit about how it represents um, quite a lot to the people of this city and our visitors. Now, the story of this memorial, of course, wouldn't be complete without reference to those devastating events that happened here in Canterbury back in 2011, and in particular to the damage that this memorial um, suffered due to those earthquakes. So we'll conclude today with a little bit of a, an insight into the conservation and repair story of this very important memorial. So right back from the 19th century through to the present day, Christchurch has been a really important port of departure for international Antarctic expeditions. Explorers, scientists, researchers, conservationists, all left from Christchurch to go down to the ice. And this was particularly case, the case in the first two decades of the 20th century, when Christchurch became the base for a number of international Antarctic expeditions. This handsome chap here is of course Robert Falcon Scott and he really led the way with the two British Antarctic expeditions that he took to the ice through Christchurch. So he left from Christchurch during his British National Antarctic Expedition known as the Discovery between 1901 and 1904 and then again during the British Antarctic Expedition known as the Terra Nova between 1910 and 1913. Now, of course, we've got to remember that at the early point of time, at the early 20th century, Christchurch has a really strong connection to Britain. It's only in the 1850s that we have um, British settlers arrive here in Christchurch, and some 60 years later, they and their descendants still have a really close connection with the mother country. Of course, this is reinforced as well through all those economic, social and political ties. In fact, it was a family try that made Robert Falcon Scott actually leave from here in Christchurch. His cousin, Robert Julian Scott, who was a lecturer in engineering at Canterbury College, had written to him recommending Christchurch as a port for him to use. When they arrived here in Christchurch, they were welcomed with our arms wide open. Cantabrians put on quite the show for them. They were invited to dinners and dances. There were church services held in their honour. And there was really strong relationship that developed between the people of Canterbury and their businesses here in Christchurch and the Antarctic explorers. In fact, many of the scientists on board these expeditions actually worked here at the museum. They undertook some of their scientific analysis work here. They wrote up their reports. They calibrated their instruments at the meteorological hut in the Botanic Gardens and many of them participated in the uh, wondrous activities down the road at the Canterbury Club. <laughs> the Antarctic explorers also thrilled the school children of Canterbury with a display of sledging in Littleton. Locals helped to provision the expeditions, they visited the explorers and they gathered to farewell the ships. You know, we've got to remember too that this is at a time when Antarctica is the last unexplored continent in the world. There was this huge sense of excitement, of adventure that permeated all interactions with the explorers. This really was, you know, the, the going to the moon of that time. When the Terra Nova left Littleton on the 26th of November 1910, Cantabrians were well aware of the dual aims of the expedition. On the one hand, there are a number of scientific objectives that the explorers wished to undertake, and on the other, a number of geographic firsts that they also hoped to achieve, among those being the first to the South Pole. 
Over the coming months, the expedition remained regularly in the pages of the press, and particularly when the Terra Nova made resupply voyages, news about those scientific achievements and their geographic exploration was regularly reported on. Although a range of scientific objectives were achieved, ultimately the um, expedition failed in its attempt to become the first to the South Pole. Robert Falcon Scott and his polar party of Edward Wilson, Henry Bowers, Edgar Evans and Lawrence Oates arrived at the South Pole in January 1912, only to meet the heartbreaking discovery that Norwegian Roald Munson had arrived there just one month earlier. Plagued by unseasonably bad weather and a series of ill health, all five members of the polar party perished on their return journey. It was not until November 1912 that the search party found the bodies of Scott, Wilson and Bowers in their tent and the notes that explained the fate of, Edgar, uh, of Evans and Oates. Almost one year after they had died, on the 10th of February 1913, the Terra Nova landed in New Zealand and shared news of their deaths with those here. News of the polar tragedy made headlines around the world with expressions of grief and regret common in all reports. Mention was made of the heroism of the men, of their sacrifice for the greater good. Newspapers also made important references to Scott's call. Scott had called to members of the public, particularly to members of the British Empire, to care for the dependents of the men who had died in the ice and also to help with the expedition's expenses. New Zealand Prime Minister William Massey shared through the press, Captain Scott's dying appeal will meet with generous response from the citizens of empire. An adequate provision for wives and families will be forthcoming for those who lost their lives for the glory of the British flag and have gone to their deaths in a manner worthy of the noblest traditions of our race. When news reached Christchurch on the 11th of February 1913, the city went into mourning. Two days later, Christchurch Cathedral held a memorial service for the Polar Party, and a number of local churches followed suit. Services made reference to the duty of these men, to their sacrifice, to concepts of grief and the absolute disaster that they met. And many also made an appeal for funds to meet Scott's last call. Almost immediately though, there was also a call for a particular New Zealand memorial to commemorate Scott and those who had died with him. Mayor Henry Holland called for a meeting and on the 19th of February, a number of interested parties met to discuss the concept. While they all agreed that the expenses of the expedition and the care of dependents was the first priority for any funds raised, they also wished to establish a permanent memorial here in Christchurch to mark the connection that Robert Falcon Scott and his comrades had with the city. As a result, as all good Christchurch meetings do, they formed a committee. The uh, Scott Memorial Fund Committee was established with the town clerk, Charles Horace Gilby, directed to create a circular for distribution in order to start making uh, arrangements for fundraising. The next meeting, some five days later, the funds were started with subscriptions from four members of the committee, Anglican Bishop Churchill Julius, Mayor Holland, Professor of uh, Biology Charles Chilton at, the at Canterbury College and his colleague Sal Coleridge Farr, who was a physics professor, all made five pound donations to the fund. They also agreed that this was to be a national memorial and approached the governor, Lord Liverpool, to be patron and Prime Minister William Massey to be president. Now their advertising methods were a little bit different to ours of today and the circular that they put together was a little bit more verbose than one might see in a pamphlet of this point in time. But 4,000 of these circulars were distributed around Canterbury. Canterbury Museum in fact took responsibility for distributing 500 of those. The circular made emotive references to the bravery of the explorers and their heroism, to the fact that they had undertaken these duties for the greater good. It was language that was very common at the time and appealed to those attributes of heroism and a lens of admiration around those Antarctic explorers. 
the committee were absolutely inundated with responses. They received significant contributions of £100 from the Ashburton County Council and £105 from the Littleton Harbour Board. Smaller contributions were also forthcoming from a number of other organisations. Sumner Borough Council donated £5, Selwyn County Council £10, the residents of the Chatham Islands put forth £2, and the Christchurch Meat Company £26. Over 58 local schools also made contributions, with Ashburton Country School making the largest. In the coming months, more than £75,000 was raised throughout the British Empire to help go towards Scots call. So this money was used for the dependents of the Polar Party, as well as the widow and the mother of two other members of the expedition who had perished on the expedition. It also went to pay off expedition expenses, including the salaries of those who had returned. Some of the money was used to publish the scientific results of the expedition, and the remaining £18,000 was set aside for memorial purposes in the United Kingdom. By August 1913, though, back here in New Zealand, the Scott Memorial Fund Committee announced that they had raised £732 for a local memorial. The committee favoured the idea of a monument, and the Christchurch Press wrote of its support of this concept. New Zealanders are not very much enamoured as a rule of statues, but the heroic death of Captain Scott and his comrades is a historical event of such unique character that there are the strongest possible reasons why it should be commemorated in enduring marble or imperishable bronze. The committee also took this opportunity to write to Scott's widow, Kathleen. Whether it, this was an attempt simply to get her assent and uh, support of the memorial project, or whether there was a slightly more uh, cunning motive in mind, isn't quite clear. However, their letter reached a 34-year-old widow who had a small child. Now, Kathleen was herself known as an artist. She had studied at the Slade School of Art in London and then later in Paris. And while she wasn't particularly well recognised at the time, she is now considered probably the best female British artist of the interwar period. Now, Kathleen had a really strong connection with New Zealand in general and Christchurch in particular. She spent her last days with her husband here in Christchurch. They stayed with expedition representative Joseph Kinsey out in Sumner. They took Governor Islington and his wife around the practice hut that had been constructed here in Christchurch. She also spent time on Quail Island inspecting the 15 Manchurian ponies that were in quarantine there. And also the 32 Siberian dogs. She took time to explore the city. She participated in those dances and those dinners, and she clearly left with a lasting impression of Christchurch. Her diaries record an awareness that this was the, you know, she was very much aware that this was the last time she would see her husband for several years. And I guess for me, it's really easy to think about how one might imagine she could have thought about this as the last time she might spend time with her husband. In fact, it was on her way back to New Zealand when she heard the news of her husband's death mid-journey in 1913. She and Oriana Wilson, who's also there in the photo, um, Oriana is was wife of the chief of the scientific staff, Edward Wilson, both mourned their husbands here in New Zealand. And before they left to return home to the United Kingdom, they shared a message through the press. We would like to express our very real gratitude to the government and people of New Zealand for their sympathy and thoughtful help to us. The forethought for our welfare has touched us very deeply and will not readily be forgotten. It's clear that she found, felt quite a great affection for this city. On the 20th of August 1913, our friend Charles Horace Gilby, um, a once time uh, principal of Christchurch Commercial College and currently at this point in time town clerk, 
became secretary for the Scott Memorial Fund Committee, started a series of correspondence with Kathleen Scott. In his first letter, he outlined the activities of the committee to date and invited Kathleen to express an opinion as to what form she thought a memorial might take. In September, they received Kathleen's typically scrawled handwritten reply. In it, she made two suggestions for the type of memorial they could consider. Either a statue group of five men with their sledge, or a slightly grander proposal for a great drinking fountain with figure or figures and a number of bronze plaques telling the tale. She noted that the committee would need to allow funds not only for, a, for the monument, but also for its base, its installation and its transport. Her letter explained that she had included a sketch of a large monument of five figures in their sledge, and also a single figure in Antarctic dress shortly to be erected in London. I have given the roughest suggestion, she wrote, which may or may not prove useful, but I am very happy to give any help possible. Gilby's response to this letter indicated that very little progress had been made due to the 1913 Great Strike a series of industrial actions where over 16,000 workers laid down their tools and a series of violent confrontations took place. In his letter, Gilby indicated that there was stone available for the base of a memorial here in Christchurch, but no suitable foundry to cast a bronze statue. At the committee's instruction, he sent her a list of four suggestions for a memorial that the committee had considered. Firstly, the idea of a monument or a statue opposite the city council buildings in the, second of, in the centre of Christchurch. Secondly, a cairn atop the Port Hills, which would be visible from the city centre, but also from ships entering the harbour at Littleton. Thirdly, a home for incurables or coronic cases. And then fourthly, an educational endowment. Kathleen's response on the 4th of January was in immediate favour of the statue and asked whether drawings might be of use for her to send of a statue that could be cast in London and sent out to New Zealand. In all kindness, she ended her letter with the message that she would be very ready to help in any way she could. For much of 1914, the committee's progress slowed. Over 200 pounds of their um, funds had come from local authorities and they required legislative approval in order to be able to use those. A series of correspondence with local politicians ensued and those contributions were made legal in the washing up bill of 1914. Of course, by that time, the First World War had been declared. This diverted much of the attention, resources and materials that were available at the time. Over the next four years, New Zealand sent 100,000 men away to war. Life on the home front changed dramatically, and more than 18,000 of those men did not return. In late 1914, Gilby wrote again to Kathleen, indicating that the committee were now in a position to proceed with the memorial, and that they had just over a thousand pounds available. He wrote that they would be very pleased to receive her drawings and benefit from her expert knowledge in arriving at a decision. While the committee hoped that Kathleen might undertake the sculptural work, Gilby did not explicitly say so. On the 3rd of February 1915, Kathleen aboard a train on the way to France where she would volunteer at a military hospital, delicately asked if the committee were thinking of employing a New Zealand sculpture to execute the statue. Or were they thinking of her doing it? She promised to forward on photographs of two memorials that she was already undertaking to Scott, one for Portsmouth and the other for Waterloo Place in London. She offered a replica of the London statue or a new one for the sum of £1,200, indicating that this would be adequate for a bronze pedestal and base. Sorry, a bronze statue and base. She equivocated, though, that perhaps, on the other hand, it is not a portrait, but an allegorical figure that is contemplated. And if you are considering another sculpture, please be sure I will do anything in my power to help with photos or the lending of costumes. I will do my best to make sure the statue is a great success, no matter what decision is taken. 
Upon her return from France in March 1915, she forwarded this newspaper cutting of the statue she had created in Plymouth. And also these two work in progress photographs of a statue she was creating for London. She assured the committee that this memorial would eventually be the much better of the two. <coughs> in fact, this model was actually based on a photograph of Robert Falcon Scott at the South Pole. In April 1915, the committee continued their correspondence with Kathleen. They also had a number of discussions about their preferences for the memorial. They indicated that the idea of a replica was their preferred one, with an artist fee, pedestal and installation, costing what they imagined to be about £1,100, and they were unanimous in the idea of asking Kathleen to undertake this work. However, the committee's desires for the memorial far surpassed the funds they had available. They also desired four bas reliefs of images of each of the polar party, bronzes with two typical scenes of the Antarctic, as well as a quote. Just two weeks after New Zealand troops engaged in action on the Gallipoli Peninsula, the committee held a meeting with subscribers. They talked through the options for the memorial and agreed to set aside a thousand pounds for a bronze replica statue, the base and the superstructure. All the subscribers adopted this recommendation. At the same point in time, the committee also sought Christchurch City Council permission to erect the statue on the reserve opposite the, provincial, uh, opposite the council chambers. For Naitahu, this area is a particularly sacred one. It's the site of many pā, yurapā, trading areas and a mahinga kai corridor. In the 1850s, of course, with the arrival of European settlers, this area of the city was mapped as part of the city of Christchurch. In this image here, we see the land office that had been installed opposite A.C. Barker's house. So that's the land office there. Uh, to give you context, that is where the um, memorial is. In 1887, a, a brick municipal chambers building, which we of course know as our Fisi Otatahi, was actually uh, replaced the land office. In May 1915, the City Council granted permission for the committee to install the memorial in what was used as a storage and rubbish yard on the corner of Worcester Boulevard and Oxford Terrace. The committee's correspondence with Kathleen continued. In fact, there's a, a file about that big of those um, lovely, easy to read handwritten uh, letters, which I have read all of them. Um, and this is one of Kathleen's letters back to the committee. In it, um, she talks about her preferred positioning of the statue, which actually coincided with the way in which the committee wanted. So the committee wanted the memorial to be facing north. And Kathleen, in this letter, reiterates that that is actually her preferred view of the statue from the left, which is the better side. The committee, of course, recognised their need to keep expenses in check, and so the city surveyor, Arthur Dudley Dobson of Arthur's past fame, was appointed to supervise its installation. He later also indicated that he would prepare the base for the pedestal at no cost to the fund, a very generous offer given that the three tenders for that work were all too high. In mid-1915, the correspondence between Gilby and Kathleen continued, and of course their letters took weeks to travel around the world, and more urgent matters were discussed via cable. On the 28th of June, Kathleen advised via cable that the cost of bronze had increased by 25% due to the war. On the 30th of June, she informed the committee that the cost of bronze now equaled that of marble. Immediately, Gilby cabled back to indicate that the committee preferred marble if it was within their means. Kathleen wrote to confirm this, indicating though that it would not be possible to do a figure in marble as well as four bronze filigrees with the funds that they had available. She wrote further, of course, that the increasing cost of bronze due to the First World War means that one hesitates to use it with objects unconnected with armaments. Kathleen agreed to provide a marble statue with a granite base and a plaque, but noted that all possible expenses would need to be cut in order to keep this within the £1,000 budget of the committee. 
The committee agreed that all five names of the Polar Party must be on the memorial and that a quote should also be placed on the pedestal. At the same time, Gilby appealed to local shipping companies in an attempt to try and reduce the cost to transport what Kathleen indicated would be 30 tonnes of material all the way from Europe to New Zealand. The Shaw, Seville and Albion Company and the New Zealand Shipping Company each agreed to transport half of the memorial for free. On the 5th of November 1915, Kathleen's bronze statue of Scott was unveiled in London by officers of the Navy. The First Lord of the Admiralty, Lord Balfour, declared it was an exceptionally rare memorial. It was not only loving hands, he spoke, but an eye that knew, and a memory that recorded all that could be seen and known to it. The unveiling made reference to times of war, and Kathleen forwarded the booklet of the unveiling to the committee here in Christchurch, along with plans for the pedestal. Dobson started to prepare the ground for the memorial. Shortly before New Zealand troops evacuated Gallipoli on the 2nd of January 1916, Kathleen suggested to the committee her favourite quote that could be emblazoned on the memorial. Had I lived, I should have had a tale to tell of the hardihood, endurance and courage of my companions, which would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. The committee preferred, however, a second quote. I do not regret this journey, which shows that Englishmen can endure hardships, help one another and meet death with as great a fortitude as ever in the past. This was the quote that went on to the bronze plaque and also onto the pedestal of the memorial. Kathleen completed a number of memorials to Scott and the Polar Party between 1913 and 1916. It is perhaps an indication of her continuing grief at the loss of her husband, the pressures of raising a small child, and the fact that she's living during a time of global conflict, that she made two mistakes in her correspondence with Gilby. The first of these was relatively unimportant. It simply referred to Scott's death in 1915 rather than 1912. The second mistake, however, had much more long-term consequences. In suggesting the wording for the plaque, Kathleen mistakenly transposed Edward Adrian Wilson's initials. So here, he is actually recognised as A.E. Wilson, not E.A. Wilson. With the details confirmed for the memorial, Kathleen proceeded with its construction. Incredibly, due to wartime import restrictions, she actually travelled into Italy in order to do so. And she travelled at a time of intense submarine warfare. The vessel that she travelled in was sunk a mere two weeks after her arrival in Italy. On the letterhead of the Grand Hotel Carrara, Kathleen wrote that work was progressing well with the memorial and she hoped to be able to ship it to New Zealand in mid-1916. The 12 cubic metre block of Carrara marble, a building grade, not a sculpting grade I should note, she wrote was a remarkably fine piece of marble, of good colour and without any flaw whatever. She also wrote that it was a great improvement on the bronze. She noted a bit of a concern about shipping the memorial in wartime. The committee, believing the risk to be a slight one and perhaps also wanting to avoid additional storage costs in London, urged her to go ahead with its shipping. Kathleen also wrote of the risk of damage to the statue in transit and the fact that she had left two additional blocks of marble against the legs to support it. She wrote that these do not at all interfere with the design but if ever she was in Christchurch again, she would have them off. The committee had two further challenges to meet before the memorial was successfully unveiled. While Kathleen believed that she was to provide the statue and the pedestal, the committee here in Christchurch understood that they would be creating the pedestal and base according to Kathleen's designs. As Gilby rushed to correct the situation via cable, he received a response that the pedestal was already in hand. 
As preparation for the foundation started in September 1916, 49 cases arrived at Littleton, containing the memorial and its pedestal. Four months later, Christchurch firm Graham & Son craned the memorial into place. The second challenge related to a misunderstanding or perhaps a lack of clarity around finances. The committee had set aside £1,000 for the statue, the base and the superstructure. £700 had been forwarded to Kathleen and in October 1916, Gilby wrote to her, noting that he had received her plans for the installation of the memorial and it was in the process of being landed. He also asked for a financial position from her, indicating that the committee hoped to have money left over to install one or more panels on the memorial. On the 4th of December, Kathleen, clearly distressed, wrote back to Gilby. She was concerned that the committee was indicating they no longer wished to pay the £300 balance of the £1,000 she believed they had agreed as a price for the memorial. She wrote, I think even the least experienced of your committee may understand that a statue of this size, carved out of one block of exquisite marble, with such a granite base and lettering, is not provided for a thousand pounds in England during a war. That I have volunteered to provide such a monument for this sum, I have done so, and it is my affair. She wrote too that the committee were not to add anything further to the pedestal. In an attempt to mitigate any distress, Mayor Henry Holland wrote back to Kathleen, indicating that rather than wanting to reduce the sum payable, they wanted to clarify that there weren't any additional costs that Kathleen had uh, undergone. The £341, including the £300 for the memorial and £41 for insurance that Kathleen had paid, would be paid. He also added his thanks for a sculptural masterpiece in such exquisite marble, and hoped that, Scott, that Kathleen would travel to Christchurch to finish the additional blocks left for stabilisation and transit. To what extent the um, misunderstanding around payment influenced the fact that Scott never travelled to New Zealand is unsure. Um, obviously, from her earlier correspondence, she did consider the statue to be complete and satisfactory as it was with those blocks left there. So at 3 p.m. on the 9th of February 1917, a large assembly gathered in glorious weather in Christchurch. School children were granted a special leave of absence to attend, and a guard of honour was formed by the Boy Scouts and Cadets of Christ College and Christchurch Boys High School. The memorial was unveiled by the Governor, opposite the municipal chambers the building in which Scott had made his first and his last official visits to the Mayor of Christchurch. A number of speakers reflected on the achievements of the expedition, particularly on the scientific results that the explorers had worked upon. Mayor Holland noted that this was a permanent reminder for generations of the future that Englishmen of these days are worthy upholders of the noblest traditions of their race. Many links were made between the Antarctic explorers and the courage and bravery of the New Zealand troops and British troops at the front in the First World War. The Christchurch Press wrote that the memorial was a lesson of courage, endurance, patriotism and high ideals of duty, with an objective not only to express admiration of their work and keep alive their memory, but also to act as an inspiration and an incentive to succeeding generations to emulate their example. For me, it, it feels absolutely incredible to think about the amount of time that these citizens devoted to a memorial, to the amount of funds they raised, to the work that was involved in arranging and installing this memorial during a period of global conflict. For those people, of course, this was part of a patriotic response. It was a place to mark civic pride and to celebrate their links with the Antarctic. It also helped, of course, that such notions were patriotic tropes during the First World War. 
The committee eventually did limit their objectives for the memorial to keep within a certain scope. And all public bodies had provided £268, and public subscriptions £732 for the memorial. A further £72 of interest had been obtained. However, that still left the committee with a £145 deficit after the cost of installing the memorial. Christchurch City Council agreed to clear these liabilities and the memorial became the property of the City of Christchurch on the 21st of May 1917. 100 years later, we can view the commission and creation of this memorial with a more nuanced and dispassionate eye. It's absolutely incredible to think that a memorial from this period was carved by a woman, but also not only by a woman, but by the subject's widow. This really does make it quite exceptional in New Zealand public statuary. That emotion that it's imbued with, the weight, the realism of it, is enhanced by the fact that we know that it was based on that original photograph. And in fact, I would suggest that it's not actually a replica of the London Memorial at all. It's an original. It's made out of marble, it's carved, it has that beautiful rough hewn, uneven surface. And of course it has those extra blocks left to add stability in its journey. <coughs> the memorial also sits at a really important junction in Kathleen's work. It gave her the confidence to carve on a large scale. And in fact, it's the largest single work she ever completed. Its rarity in her body of work is furthermore enhanced by the fact that most of her other sculptures were modelled or cast. It has an extremely high artistic significance and probably the best of her six extant model, uh, uh, memorials to the Polar Party. Over the decades since its installation, the memorial became part of the heritage fabric of the city. Grassed areas, brickwork, lights, garden beds were all added to its surrounds and of course in 1972 the Christchurch Beautifying Association's fountain was also added nearby. The memorial also became a site of community interactions. The first of these in 1928 when American naval commander um, Richard Byrd held an address at the memorial and laid the first recorded wreath. Another wreath was laid in 1933 at the request of Clarence Hare, who was a Christchurch resident involved in the expedition. And then in 1937, Mayor Beanland laid a memorial at the request of the New Zealand Antarctic Society. And in fact, that is a practice that has been continuing annually ever since then. For the 8,000 people who travel through Christchurch to and from their way to the ice each year, the memorial was an important place to reflect, to commemorate, to pay their respects, and it has become a part of our heritage, uh, earning listings in local and national heritage. For 100 years then, the memorial stood as a source of pride for locals, particularly those with an enthusiasm for Antarctica. On the 22nd of February 2011, there was of course a dramatic change. A magnitude 6.3 earthquake toppled the statue from its plinth. The memorial broke in two at the thinnest and therefore the weakest part of the legs. On the 4th of April, council contractors moved the statue from the red zone, as we'll all remember that time of course, the, the city is um, very much cordoned off to all but most essential personnel. They had to cut the bent bronze pole in order to be able to move the statue and he was taken into storage. The statue was brought out again for Ice Fest in 2012. He was on show in the Scots Last Expedition exhibition here at the museum in 2013 and then again at Quake City up until 2017. The plinths remained empty. In mid-2016, after the reinstatement of the John Robert Godley and William Rolleston statues, council indicated that they were now ready to approach the Scott Memorial as a project. A special project group was established, comprising of a conservator, an engineer, a stonemason and a heritage expert. 
because of the incredibly steep and complex break in the number of microfractures and fissures that the marble had sustained in the earthquake, conventional repair methods were not going to be feasible for the statue's repair. On top of this, the internal construction of the pedestal was unknown, and the pedestal could potentially act as a point of weakness in any future repair strategy. The project group considered a wide range of international evidence and options, the materials that could be used, and started to assess the merits and risks of dozens of different op options for the memorial. This ranged from no treatment of the statue whatsoever and the installation of a new memorial statue, right through to some form of external support or bracing to put the statue back in place. As part of this risk assessment, the project group recognised that a consultation with this community was really necessary in order to be able to ascertain what ways the repair process might affect the significance of the memorial. As all things happen in Christchurch, there are of course fabulous things to work around and um, at that point in time it was hoped to be able to have the memorial back up and ready in time for the Antarctic season opening in September 2017. So you're talking about quite a tight time frame. So actually that community consultation process and the group assessment of those repair options took place in parallel. So Christchurch City Council commissioned a curator from here at Canterbury Museum to undertake that significance assessment. The report told the history of the memorial and summarised stakeholder feedback about the significance of the memorial to the community and how possible repair options might affect this significance. The report was based on primary and secondary research, including more than 20 in-depth interviews with stakeholders. The report concluded that the memorial was one of a limited number of significant Antarctic uh, of memorials to significant Antarctic exploration in the 20th century, and was in fact perhaps the finest example in the world due to its artistic, historic and symbolic significance, as well as its provenance and rarity. The memorial symbolised a number of connections, connections between Christchurch City and Antarctica, between New Zealand and the British Empire, and the relationship between this city and a number of international Antarctic stakeholders. Given this high significance, there was a unanimous mandate from all stakeholders to work towards the repair and return of the memorial to its original plinth. This mandate was qualified by the directive, however, that any changes to the exterior of the memorial, particularly to the exterior of the statue, must be both minimal and sympathetic. As a result, the project team looked at low impact repair processes that would be able to balance the seismic requirements of an outside statue with the stakeholder's requirements for a very low minimal impact um, on the surface, the exterior surface of the statue. That, that integrity, I guess, of the, the view of the statue was paramount. The project team therefore looked towards internal drilling as their preferred option, and one option came to the fore. Now, the project team recognised, however, that testing was necessary because there was an incredibly high risk with internal drilling. There was a very high risk, in fact, that drilling could cause the statue to shatter completely. For stakeholders, that risk was acceptable in order to achieve the wider objective. So in June 2017, that testing process commenced. And you can see here a couple of images. So up on the top left hand quarter, corner is the stone mason creating a clay mould of the original leg of the statue. And that was used to create this replica. So this is a replica of that leg carved from the same type of Karara marble that the original statue was and that replica was actually cut at the same angle of the break as the original sculptor, so that uh, of the original um, fracture, so that the testing could really determine whether this repair process would work on the same kind of break on the original statue. So under the supervision of the structural engineer, uh, the replica here was tested 
Um, you can see there are a number of bands and I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Now the testing process, um, and that is the actual replica under testing procedures, showed that their um, repair process met 125% of the design load. So that was a pressure of 1.9 tonnes. In fact, it took until 3.9 tonnes, almost twice the design load, for the um, repair process to fail. So that meant for the project team that they'd come up with a visually acceptable solution that met required earthquake standards. This solution was communicated to stakeholders who um, you know, generally received it very well. So to give you a bit more of the technical side of things, and forgive me because I'm not an engineer, um, but this will give you a little bit of a sense. So this is actually a really innovative technique. It has never been used on historic marble ever before. And the technique was used to drill four carbon fiber rods, two in each leg, down the length of the statue and into the base. The break, which you can see through that red line there, would be attached using a very strong adhesive. And then an internal confinement process. So what these are here are the use of carbon fibre tow, a kind of thread that would be woven through to be able to increase the resilience of the leg so that if any future event meant that the statue toppled, this would be strong enough to prevent any spalling of that area. At the same time as these plans were taking place, the project team also needed to investigate the pedestal. Mm. They decided that the pedestal could be strengthened by drilling through epox and epoxying stainless steel rods down into the pedestal, and then that the plate that the statue rested upon would be reconnected using this very heavy steel spring. In essence, it was kind of like putting a form of base isolation or suspension under the statue, so it could rock slightly in a future earthquake and therefore limit any risk and damage. This was an incredibly innovative project, and it really was also innovative in the way it had to be undertaken. So this is a 2.6 metre high statue, and it weighs more than 2.5 tonnes. Because of where the weight was in the um, two damaged portions, the repair work actually had to take place with the statue upside down. It also had to take place in such a way that the statue could be protected and stabilised while the repair work took place. And it had to be done in an environment that could be temperature controlled during a Christchurch winter. A lot of the materials they were using um, had very particular temperature requirements to ensure their efficacy and so that was a really important thing as part of the process. So this is the workspace that they used, uh, these fabulous ducted areas of the way in which temperature control was managed in that space. So this is my favourite part of this talk, um, some of the pretty pictures of the repair process. So first off, Scott is wrapped, he's safely stropped and he's moved to an upside down position where he is then craned into that workspace we saw earlier. Sand is added in about up to his navel to be able to protect him and again it was incredible because you need to be able to use a material that doesn't risk damaging the marble but it was also strong enough not to shift too much during this process. The second portion, the legs, were then lifted in See what I mean? They're awesome, aren't they? <laughs> and, um, and the roof sealed off and the area heated. So the first step for the project team was then to carve out a small indentation in the legs where the volume of, of adhesive could be added. And those legs were then lowered and attached on to the bottom well, or the top of the statue, depending what way you look at it. The project team also had to consider the precision nature of the holes they would need to drill in the statue. Obviously you want to consider that really carefully before you start drilling because you can't make a mistake, can you? So what they actually constructed was a kind of a 3D model, a contour model of those legs so they could know actually if they put one vertical rod like that that it would go all the way through and equally when the horizontal bands came that they weren't drilling through those rods and therefore limiting the efficacy of the repair. So you can see here they've put dummied um, carbon fibre rods in 
to practice where they would then put the carbon fibre toe through. So drilling was very much a precision activity, but it used a two metre long drill bit. And I can only imagine how absolutely terrifying it would have been. Here you can see our stonemason creating the drill holes for the carbon fibre thread. So at this point in time, those carbon fibre rods had been inserted vertically and these holes are happening horizontally to add that stability. So the thread's kind of like, um, my audience will know with me, you know, your old tape cassettes and you get that, um, the, yeah, the tape coming out. It's kind of like that, but incredibly strong. And so these were threaded through those holes 24 times to give that kind of stability. An encapsulating resin was then used to ensure there were no air pockets and so that no water could get inside the, um, the, the memorial. It's interesting, the things you don't really think about doing the practice is that, of course, you inject encapsulating resin on one side and it just spews out the other side. Um, so these rather unusual looking paraphernalia is attached there which just stop that process and hold it all in place. As I mentioned, that exterior view of the statue was absolutely paramount. And so it was really important when it came time to look at these holes that they were covered in such a way that it was sympathetic and very close to the original. And so the stonemason actually used those cores that had been drilled out to grind them down into a dust and create a compound that was used. So that's literally a close up of the kind of colour variation that you can see when you are very close to the statue. Um, I would certainly challenge you all when you go down and see it in place to see whether you can spot those holes. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite miraculous really what they achieved. And then the hard job began. Well, you've got to get Scott back up and out of there again. So first step was of course to suction off all that sand and then to lift him out of the container. He was lifted up into the air and I think this is my favourite photo. Quite extraordinary. The trickiest part was of course writing the statue because as you turn him from that upside down position he's pivoting on that weak point where the repair had just taken place and so there were some very very anxious people watching on. Thankfully he was righted quite appropriately and returned to the ground. His wrapping were removed and a final clean was undertaken by a conservator. Now this repair is absolutely a world first and our Mayor Leanne Dalziel commented about the modern technology used and the international relationships developed during this process. She commented that it was a British artist's work, worked upon by New Zealand experts with Italian marble, Australian epoxy and US expertise on the repair strategy. A very fitting international collaboration for our Scott. And on the 2nd of October, just a couple of months ago, the statue of Robert Falcon Scott made its way through the streets of Christchurch on a warm spring day. He was protected, stropped, and lifted back onto his original pedestal. On the 6th of October 2017, the weekend of the Antarctic season opening for this year, 100 years and seven months after he was originally unveiled and some six and a half years after he was thrown from his plinth in the earthquake, the statue of Robert Falcon Scott was unveiled for the second time. Dr Daniel Asquith, great-grandson of Kathleen and Robert, attended the ceremony with his children. In his speech, he commented that the memorial commemorates not just Robert Falcon Scott and the Polar Party, but it signifies so much more than that. It acknowledges stories of scientific and personal endeavour, of striving against adversity, of endurance and companionship, themes which still resonate today. It is testimony to the spirit of this city that as it redefines itself, it does so with sophisticated innovation, dedicated precision, and skillful attention to detail. At 3 p.m., Mayor Leanne Dalziel, descendants of Kathleen and Robert Scott, 
a Ngāitua Herere representative to Māori Tau, unveiled the memorial for the second time. The memorial now stands again, ready to inspire new generations of explorers, researchers and scientists, and ready for the next chapter in its story. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.